<laughs> Hi, this is Dr. Brian Gantworker. I'm the founder and president of the Craniospinal Center of Los Angeles. You are listening to the interview with a surgeon with the surgeon agent, Matthew Bukovic. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining Interview with the Surgeon. Today, we welcome Dr. Brian Gantworker, founder of the Cranial Spinal Center of Los Angeles. Doc, how are we doing today? Great, Matthew. Thanks for having me. It's a real pleasure. So let's just jump right into it. What were your goals and aspirations during your residency, and how did those change throughout your fellowship? Well, I trained in Cleveland, Ohio at Case Western, and we had the unique opportunity to work with um, guys who had been out essentially in private practice and then joined an academic institution. And um, there were two surgeons in particular, uh, a guy named Ben Columby and a guy named Matt Likovic, who, uh, one of whom has already passed away, unfortunately, recently. And they were private practice guys. But what I really enjoyed about it is that they were existing in the academic sphere, but they were able to sort of keep their own style. And it was working with them extensively and realizing how close they were to their patients. That's what I wanted to have. And it would seem like their way of, of working with patients, one of them, especially I remember, used to record his progress notes while the patients were in the room. He was totally and completely transparent with everybody. Us too, almost to the point of pain, being painful. But um, they were always very upfront with the patients. One of them used to round on patients twice a day, truly, truly dedicated surgeons. And they were also human beings, very uh, empathetic and just very salt of the earth. And I just didn't get that feeling from all the surgeons, some of whom were obviously very gifted, extremely intelligent, uh, resource, really research intensive. But it was their way of practicing medicine that I really yearned for. And I thought to myself, that's kind of how I have to head in terms of my career. I would probably have to go into a smaller private practice where I can practice the way I wanted to, be close to patients and not really have a lot of layers between me and them. Uh, on one hand, it was a trade-off, right? You, you end up having to be on call essentially for yourself a lot of the time, if not all the time. But there was a relationship you could build with your patients and a closeness you could obtain that was very, very difficult to get when you were in academics. That was sort of part of the inspiration and what made me realize that that's what felt right to me. So kind of take us through that fellowship here, heading into your first job search. What was that like and how that yeah. perspective changed in the beginning years of your career? Well, my fellowship was at the Barrow Neurological Institute in Phoenix. And I know you've had Dr. Spetzler on. I had a, a pleasure of working with him on a few, quite a few cases. And I still call him sometimes when I have a difficult cranial case. But my, my main mentor was uh, Dr. Volker Sontag, who sort of was a group of um, uh, spinal neurosurgeons who essentially reestablished neurosurgical presence in spine. Not a lot of people know this, but neurosurgeons were almost out of spine 20, 30 years ago. And there was a core group of people that, you know, Sontag was a member of that brought us back into that specialty. So I learned a lot of things that year. And, and that, that institution is still kind of a private institution where you have basically private practice neurosurgeons, a large group of them working together, essentially in a large functioning organism that is also obviously training people, fellows and residents. During that time, I got a taste of more private practice because we would cover outside facilities. And I started my job search initially looking to go to a place where I wanted a large urban center where I could be, you know, sort of, a, there'd be a large catchment of patients. But also I had to trade off and realize that I would be a potentially small fish in a very, very big pond. Once I got over that and got over my ego, um, it became a little bit easier to find what I was looking for. During that time, though, it was 2008, 2009. As you probably recall, it was the economic downturn. And everything went upside down. And there were a lot of places that were not hiring. And I had to sort of do some cold calls to find a place um, to where I wanted to go to and end up being here in Los Angeles. And um, during that time, you know, negotiating my contracts, having a look around and then eventually getting to LA and, and realizing where I could fit in, where I could carve out my niche. I learned a lot about the do's and don'ts of how to conduct yourself, how to start introducing yourself and uh, realizing what I did and did not want to do. And, and unfortunately it was kind of on the fly on the job training and learning really um, because you can sort of visualize and, and fantasize about what, what you think this is going to be. And then there's the, the reality of what's, what ends up happening. And I think if you can make that space as small as possible, 
by having realistic expectations, but you also really have to dream. And, and one of my uh, uh, plastic surgery colleagues once told me, you know, you have to hang your shingle where you want to be. And um, if you don't do that, then you're going to end up kind of being wherever you end up. So, and sometimes you are swimming, you are swimming kind of uphill and it's difficult and you face challenges that you never realized were even possible. The kind of stuff that you have to put up with and, and get through in order to get to where you want to be. Now, taking us through since you went private practice, you know, what were some of the obstacles that you faced in the beginning years of starting your own practice? Well, part of the obstacles were establishing a niche somewhere and realizing what the environment looks like where you want to practice. And uh, you have to really decide what kind of surgeon you want to be. Do you want to be a person who does a lot of trauma? Do you want to do spine? Do you want to have like a niche practice in, in another aspect of neurosurgery? But for the most part, in private practice, you're doing a lot of spine, you're doing a lot of general call, and you have to be prepared for that. You know, you may not be the Chiari surgeon to the stars, although sometimes there are, you know, opportunities to do stuff like that. But really, you know, may, you may not want to do that. You may not want to end up being that person because you'll end up with a lot of strange stuff coming across your desk. But you have to decide and come to terms with what you can, what you want to be and what you can be. Um, and that is sort of getting a feel for where you are. Let's say geographically you're in a, a large city or in the suburbs. You have to look around and, and meet the doctors that are there and find out what they need. They'll say to you, you'll, you'll end up bringing them lunch or something. In the pre-COVID days, we, we'd bring them lunch or bring them coffee or bagels or something. Meet the staff, start talking to them. Say, hey, um, I understand you're working with Dr. Smith. Um, tell me sort of what your relationship has been with Dr. Smith, him or her, and find out like, what are the pain points for them? Is it hard to get in to see Dr. Smith? Then you need to make it easy. Um, Dr. Smith never gave out uh, his or her cell phone. You give out your, your cell phone to the, to the doctor and the, and the staff. So you find out where, where the abilities, where your abilities lie in terms of getting referrals to start. And obviously being on call is going to be part of that. And, um, it's rare that you can show up to a private practice job and not be on call at the facility nearby. So you're going to be putting in some pain um, and you're going to bleed a little bit. But I, I think at the end of the day, if you can find out where the needs are and overlay that with who you are as a surgeon and as a person, you'll be much happier, much likely to stay where you end up. You know, a lot of times I'm having conversations with clients regarding, you know, how do you finance a practice and kind of seeing that you went through that process what are some of the things you learned yeah. and what advice do you have with that aspect? Well, the practice was started by my wife and myself, and we really knew jack squat about starting anything. And thank God for her. Uh, we ended up um, one day, I was sort of six months into my first job and wasn't happy. We, you know, all of us were not really feeling it anymore. And I, I think it became clear I need to branch off and do my own thing. And um I ended up talking to my wife and my wife said, uh, well, why don't we start a practice and I can, you know, help run it temporarily, which ended up becoming, you know, 11 years later. Um, but she was part of a, a oral surgery practice, actually an orthodontics practice that catered to, you know, very A-list clients. And she sort of got familiar with how to do things, you know, the day to day. So I, I relied on her and, le and, and still do lean on her very heavily for certain things. But to get the money together, and that's like the most critical part, and that's what nobody was able to tell me how to do. The first thing is you need to get yourself a line of credit with a bank. And that is probably the most important thing. And if you can get an open line of credit rather than a revolving line of credit or a single SBA loan, I do recommend that. Um, the, the line of credit helps you kind of you know, finance things, and then you can pay it back, pay it back down. It's like an accordion of money, just but you have to be responsible with it. And don't ask for too much. Don't ask for like $300,000 because A, you'll get turned down. B, you'll never pay that back if you get that deep into it. And C, very few people will give it to you uh, with, 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 with no collateral. And I ended up working with a really great bank. And I had very little, if any, collateral because I'm just starting out. I book a business, maybe 25 patients to start with. And those people like followed me. And um, get yourself a line of credit. Get a P.O. box where you can get payments and checks sent to. You don't want your checks being sent to your house. So that's more of like a admin type stuff, but it's all part and part and parcel and, and get yourself a business credit card. So those are the, the, the three things I would say you absolutely need to do. And you're going to obviously need to start, you know, taking call and getting call checks and 
those kind of things. But really, really important, the last thing is to make sure that you're, you're set up with Medicare. Because when you, when you, if you decide to go off on your own, or if you're part of another practice, you got to make sure you get a P10 number and get signed up with Medicare, because that's going to be probably the bulk of your payments are going to come from there. And then, you know, obviously negotiating contracts and things with insurance company, which are very, you know, difficult, um, if, if not impossible sometimes. But those four things, I think, are really like your, your basic, basic groundwork for getting started. But revolving line of credit, getting yourself a P.O. box where they can send checks to the insurance companies, getting yourself a business credit card, uh, you know, and being very responsible with it. And then, of course, you know, getting yourself signed up with Medicare. And that's it, it doesn't sound like financials, but. Let me tell you, once you start taking call and you're un- signed up with Medicare, those checks will come first. Those, that money will come first. And that will end up like paying, you know, essentially your overhead, really. That's, that's, and everything else is going to be cream on top of that. Now, another conversation I have a lot with clients is the marketing aspect. And I think obviously you would agree oh, that yeah. social media is such a big yeah. thing right now. And it's, you know, for mm-hmm. some reason, a lot it of is. the neurosurgeons coming out don't really have strong social medias compared to maybe orthos or plastics. So what advice right. do you have with that? And also just regarding them being able to market and network without being able to really see people in person, how do you foresee that happening yeah. in the future? Well, you have to be of value. And I think you have to put things out there that people find useful. Um, I am not the biggest Twitter guy. And I, I certainly have a lot of um, uh, other things I do in social media. But what I do, I provide a service. You know, For instance, you know, if you check my blog, I kind of help people run through insurance. Like what is insurance? What is coinsurance? Sort of a very quick and easy thing that they can look at. And so you're making contact and reaching out to people that way. Um, talk about basic things like disc arthroplasty. What is uh, spine? What is the, what are the causes of back pain? So you have to have people interact with your stuff. And ultimately if people reach out to you, you need to complete that, complete that connection, but you have to be also be very careful. Um, I do know uh, for a fact, there are a lot of surgeons who like to give out medical advice very freely over the internet. And that's not okay. That's never okay. It's different. You know, being of service is being different from, from giving out medical advice. If you're giving out medical advice, I strongly caution surgeons not to do that. Um, it, there could be major problems with your, your medical license. There can be issues with your malpractice carrier and you can end up getting yourself and your patients in trouble. But so you have to be, have a very clear delineated line where that is. The other thing, though, to think about is when you do interact on social media, you put up Instagram posts, you put up things on Facebook, not so much anymore, but really Instagram and Twitter, you really want to be of service, be of value. And you don't have to make like a, a six-page blog post. No one is going to look at that. But, you know, ha- and also be relevant. You know, if something's going on with regards to your specialty in the media, like, Someone very famous has a head injury, or you can always comment on things like that where you can help uh, demystify terms like TBI, DAI. What does a spinal cord injury look like? What, what happens when people get a spinal fracture? I know there were several uh, famous people who recently suffered you know, spinal fractures, and they were fixed by some of my colleagues. So that's a good thing you want to be able to, to comment on and help demystify things. If you can help demystify medical things, you're being of service. You're being of value. And I think if you're going to be on social media, try to be of value, try to be of service, and then you'll find yourself having sort of maybe not the, the 5 million follower thing, but you definitely looked at as sort of a trusted voice, and, and that will pay itself forward going, uh, going forward in your practice. And people will look at that stuff and before they come to you. And if you're a hooligan or a charlatan, you're, you're pushing stuff, you know, that, that, that has its own ups and downs too. What would you say were some of the keys to your success that shaped your early career as you climbed to the top of your industry? Yeah. So I don't know if I'm, I was at the top of my industry, Matthew, but I, let me just say, I'm very grateful for who come. I'm very grateful for what I have. Um, but I think at the beginning, you really have to essentially make yourself extremely available. Um, you have to be available all the time. Um, you have to be on call probably at one or two, maybe more places. Uh, Don't spread yourself too thin, though, because you'll end up um, creating a problem for your patients if uh, things are going on in multiple hospitals and you don't have anybody to cover you. But certainly uh, volunteering for call, doing call, uh, hopefully getting paid for call, uh, taking on very tough cases. And that's going to be very difficult, too, because sometimes those tough cases, they don't turn out so good. And uh, a lot of times that's not your fault for being uh, 
for being quote unquote bad, but you're, you're a good surgeon, you show up and sometimes those things are not going to go well, but you, it's very important to get out in front of, of things when they don't go right um, and be upfront with your patients and with your referring doctors. But hopefully as you get better and better, that gets less and less frequent and you learn some stuff. When you climb to the top, quote unquote, and again, I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'm at the top, but um, I feel like I've learned a lot of stuff over the past, you know, almost dozen years. Um, you really have got to own things. You've got to own your patients and you've got to own your outcomes. And the more you do that, the better your reputation gets. And I think if you're one of these people that operates and forgets, you're going to end up not being happy with where you end up. Um, some people do that, you know, uh, so hopefully most don't. But if you really, if you really in intertwined with your patients and your outcomes, you're going to find that over and over again, patients will be grateful. They'll refer other patients to you. The doctors will be happy. They'll refer more patients to you. And I don't think it should be about having as many contracts as possible. Although some of my colleagues do, they feel like they need to be on with every single insurance. In private practice, that could end up hurting you quite a bit because eventually you'll get a lot of patients. Yes, but you may not be able to do as good a job or be as engaged with those patients. And sometimes things can get, could fall, fall out. And um, that's not good. But that's what I'm saying is you need to be available. You need to be interlaced with your patients. You need to be committed and you need to own your outcomes. If they're good outcomes, be grateful. If they're bad outcomes, own it. Another big conversation that's been happening is that in 2020, I personally had a couple of clients either had job offers pulled or renegotiated. And I think heading into yeah. 2021, especially in the private sector, we don't know what's going to happen there. So what advice do you have for the graduating residents and fellows entering the job market for the first time? Number one, get a contract attorney, not some friend who knows a little bit about real estate law. That's not good. Pay the money to get somebody who's a healthcare attorney. And if you don't need a referral, find one. Um, secondly, don't take anything for granted. Make sure everything is in writing on paper. Because I've had, my own brother had an offer from a place where the offer was a letter. And, you know, that's, that's not okay. You need an actual contract to look at. Maybe that's how the place does it. That, that's okay. That's fine. But maybe that's not something you should look at then. But I, I think it's very, very important that um, things be in writing on the contract. And if offers are pulled, then you should be able to move on and, and go somewhere else. Because if it doesn't feel right now, it sure as heck not going to feel right in two years when you realize that those, those clauses that they, they, they think, oh, well, we'll never actually exercise that clause to reduce your pay or, or to lay you off. They'll, they will exercise that and they will do that. So anything that's in there can be committed. And it's much easier to have it in writing and tell your employer if they decide to run a follow that, that, well, it says right here in paragraph three, section two, you can't do this. And, you know, I certainly don't want to have to get legal involved now, do you? You don't want to do that. I, I, I like working here. So those usually are, are good ways to leverage your power as an employee. But certainly if something doesn't look right on the day you sign it, it's not going to look any better two years later when you realize that what, what that unlikely scenario becomes, uh, you know, comes to fruition and you're looking at it and you're looking at the choice between leaving where you just ended up you know, establishing yourself and starting all over again and being able to work through an employment issue with your employer. So get an attorney, get it in writing, don't accept the letter, and please make sure that you're okay with all the terms and stipulations. It's painful to look through, but make sure everything you negotiated is in there. Your sign-on bonus, your relocation, how things can be paid back, is the income considered, is the income guarantee you're going to get considered 1099 income, do you have to pay taxes on that, and if so, you know, what, what are the other stipulations? Are there force majeure clauses? And a lot of, there's now these, all these COVID writers now coming out on a lot of contracts. You know, what happens if COVID explodes again? You have to know what, what are the outcomes? I mean, can they lay you off just based on COVID? You know, can they, can they have to have certain, certain benchmarks they have to reach in order to say, I'm sorry, we can't afford you anymore. And, and if that happens, what are your, re, what are your recourses, if any? And don't be surprised if they, if they exercise those. I just don't, you know, surprises are terrible in employment. So just make sure you know what all those things, what knows, know what all those things can be. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Interview with the Surgeon. Until next time, stay focused and keep following your dreams.